Hello, my name is Stephen. Welcome to HiFinder Tech Talks, where we discover the technology that makes the hydrogen economy work. Hydrogen cooling is something that we hear about a lot, that's important, and today I'm pleased to welcome an, ex an expert in this field. He hails from Austria, and is an energy engineer, and works for Kustec that have been engaged in cooling for a very long time, and I think hydrogen cooling for over 10 years. It is my special pleasure to welcome Florian Lechner. Thank you, Stephen. Hello, Florian. Welcome, and glad that you made it. Can you just very briefly tell us what is hydrogen cooling? Hydrogen cooling is, um, we cool down hot hydrogen to a lower level. Oh, okay. Oh, well, that is actually pretty straightforward, yeah. yes. Uh, and we know hydrogen has some special qualities. Where is this needed? Um, our units are needed at hydrogen filling stations. At filling stations, okay. So maybe can you tell us a little bit more about that, where they are needed and how that works? Yeah, yeah. I can show you on our um, example. Yeah, oh, okay, we have a hydrogen diagram. filling station. Yes. So um, at seven, you see the supply of this station mm -hmm. that can be, in this case, it's a tube trailer, but can be also an electrolyzer. Mm -hmm. At six, there are some high pressure storage for hydrogen. Uh, in this area, you can see the dispenser. And at one is the cooling unit. OK, you have the cooling unit right, right in there. And um, well, how, how does one cool hydrogen? And how, how can <coughs> one even do this? Um, it can be done with a heat exchanger mm -hmm. that is placed by side the dispenser mm -hmm. or inside the dispenser. OK. So that means you have a heat exchanger and then you have a, a cooling uh, device here. Maybe, uh, Florian, can you take us a little bit deeper and show us okay. how this exactly works? Um, I have this slide yeah. prepared. Yeah. So here you can see the station mm -hmm. and the storages, mm -hmm. then a pressure regulator, mm -hmm. a heat exchanger, and then the vehicle itself. Okay. So um, the hot hydrogen is flowing through this pressure regulator inside the car. Mm -hmm. So this is this is the heat exchanger where you say you go down to minus 40 degrees. Correct. Okay, okay. And, and how, okay, yeah. So um, after this uh, pressure regulator or ramp regulator, yes. um, the true Thompson effect mm -hmm. heats up the hydrogen mm -hmm. and the heat exchanger needs to cool down, as you said, to minus 40 to compensate the temperature increase inside the tank of the vehicle. Okay. Because the hydrogen is get getting compressed there. Okay, it gets compressed in the vehicle, so it gets hot there again. Correct. And also, as it gets decompressed, it also gets hot. Is that yeah, correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay, that's special nature of hydrogen. Okay, and that's why you have that. Okay, maybe can you, you show us a little bit more about this whole cooling thing? I mean, to, to come to minus forty, I guess that is not uh, something you do every day. Correct. Well, except you do it every day, <laughs> but <Yeah>. not we. <laughs> So um, the thing is why cooling is needed yeah. is because of the tank that only can withstand 85 degrees Celsius. Uh -huh. So that's the reason why it's necessary to cool. And we have several uh, possibilities to cool. Mm -hmm. So um, we decide between active and passive cooling. Mm -hmm. And the active cooling divided then directly in indirect cooling. So um, uh, yeah, we, ha we, have, we have a diagram here. So you have active and passive. Yeah. And direct and indirect. Okay. Correct. Which is under the active side. Okay. So yeah. where, where are we going in now? What are, which one are we looking at now? Um, I can show you now the, the examples. Yeah. Ah, okay. So direct cooling means we cool down the hydrogen directly uh, via diffusion bounded heat exchanger. That's this That's one here. This one here. Yeah. Okay. So then there is an, uh, the indirect cooling. Mm -hmm. That means there's a uh, fluid in between. So, but it's also uh, used a diffusion bonded heat exchanger. Mm -hmm. And then we have the last one is the passive cooling. Um, here we use an aluminum block heat exchanger. So what's the difference between the indirect one? You have a, you, you, you cool, so in the direct, you cool the hydrogen directly. Correct. In the same heat exchanger. That, so yeah. there's hydrogen on one side. And the refrigerant on the other, on the other side. side. Okay, yeah. and then in the Correct. indirect? There's a fluid in between. Okay, so in the, you have, you, you have first, Cool the refri you cool the refrigerant, and the the refrigerant cools one liquid, and and then that the then cools the yeah. hydrogen. That's but the hydrogen. I can explain this in detail. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So ah, we have um, this is a, a, a typical refrigerant loop. Yes. For direct cooling. Yes. So that means this heat exchanger can be the diffusion bonded heat exchanger inside the dispenser. Yes. 
there is the expansion valve, a compressor, and a condenser. So they are the main components yeah. of a refrigerant loop. Yeah. So um, the liquid refrigerant gets evaporated here in this heat exchanger. Yeah. So it takes the energy from the hydrogen, yeah. cool the hydrogen down. Then the gaseous refrigerant uh, is sucked by the compressor okay. and gets compressed. Okay. During this compression, it is getting very hot. Okay, so it's, it's, it's hot on this side. Hot and on hot. high pressure. Ah, right, okay. And at the condenser, mm -hmm. this is a, a thin heat exchanger yes. uh, with a fan. And this heat exchanger gives the energy back to the ambient air. Ah, okay, so this is blowing air through there and then Correct. the heat goes out. Okay. And then the refrigerant is getting liquefied there. Ah, in, inside that one. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then the loop starts again. Okay. So that means it, it comes out from the, the, this, this heat exchanger, the, the, the thin heat exchanger yeah. comes through here. Uh, at what temperature does it uh, come out here, more or less? Um, it's roughly ambient temperature, a little bit higher. Oh yeah, okay, because of the air, obviously. Yeah. And then once it runs through the expansion valve, there the temperature drops again. Correct, because of the uh, pressure drop. All right, okay, okay. So that means, where do we have the minus 40? Uh, uh, the minus 40 will start here. Here, okay. Uh, Till it's evaporated, then a little bit superheat. Yeah. So that means it, uh, it takes, uh, takes care that there is only gaseous okay. refrigerant outcoming of the heat exchanger. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's essentially the cooling loop that happens inside your cooling uh, device. So not Correct. at the not at the dispenser, but inside that cooling unit, which we saw no, in that photo. No, this this is um, from from till here. Yeah. This is in our cooling unit. Uh huh. And. This section is at the dispenser. At the dispenser. So we need some piping in between. All ah, right. Okay. So there's there's long pipes basically taken yeah. out there. Okay. All right. Understood. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so how does this go on? And is there is there more to it? Uh, this is basically the, the process. Yeah. Uh, for direct cooling. Yes. Um, now I can show you indirect cooling. Ah yes. So yes. we have the quite the same loop here. Yes. But. Um, here we have an, an, this heat exchanger is not cooling then the hydrogen, yeah. it's cooling a coolant, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. a brine or water glycol. Then we have some pumps here and valves and storage, so that this coolant uh, is stored, and this heat exchanger is then inside the dispenser again. Okay. Understood. So there is also a, a boundary here and piping on site. And when, when so this this is the a coolant. This what what would be the coolant here? And you said here we have brine or yeah, something like that. Yeah, a liquid, a liquid medium. Okay. Yeah, and, and it stays always liquid. It stays always. Okay. Yeah. and okay. here is the refrigerant. Yes. That is in one phase gaseous and in the other phase. Okay. Liquid. Well, what are the, what types of refrigerants do you use there? Um, we focus on CO2 as a refrigerant. As a, as a refrigerant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. 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 Because it's the it's very eco friendly. Ah. Okay. All right. Okay. That's that's uh, obviously very important. You know, as we're uh, trying to make this part of a sustainable cycle. So, um, how how do you regulate the system? You know, I I know that with temperature and so on, this can mm -hmm. sometimes be a challenge. Yeah. Um, how do you does, it, does the hydrogen always come at the same temperature from the storage, or you know, is there mm -hmm. a faster or slower flow? How does that work? Um, yeah, as you said, there is the, the mass flow is very fluctuating. Yes. So there is an, 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 a high flow at the beginning, and then it's, it's decreasing a little bit. Yeah. And also the temperature is not constant. It depends on the ambient temperature and also on the type of the station, so how many pressure banks are available and so on. Yes. And also at which at which pressure the car is coming. Okay. So if the starting pressure is higher or lower, just do you do you difference. actually know what pressure is in the or what temperature is in the car? No, we no. don't receive this info. Ah, okay, okay. Um, and then we can uh, regulate our cooling capacity. Okay. After that, mm -hmm. so we ha we can control the expansion valve. Yes. Then the speed of the compressor. And we also have a hot gas bypass, mm -hmm. so we can regulate our cooling capacity from zero to 100%. Okay, so just, just to looking at this diagram, mm -hmm. so if you want to cool more, what do you do? You, yeah. you spin up the compressor. Maybe I can show it better at this one. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you need more cooling capacity, you run the compressor higher, higher at higher frequency, at high, yeah. so more uh, refrigerant is pumped through the system and more mass flow means 
more cooling capacity. More cool. okay, so, okay, so you have a lower pressure here and then higher pressure yeah. on that right. side. Okay. And do you do anything with the expansion valve? Do you regulate that as well? Yeah, we regulate also this expansion valve. This expansion valve is controlling the mass flow yes. through the heat exchanger. Okay. So um, if there is less uh, cooling capacity needed, mm -hmm. the mass flow is also reduced for the expansion valve. Okay. All right. Okay. And just you, you mentioned in the other one, sorry for jumping a little bit, but you mentioned mm -hmm. the other one that you, you're using um, brine, and in this cycle you would use CO2. And then, yeah. so the, 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 where would the CO2 be liquid and where would it be gaseous? Again, can you just help us? Um, it's getting liquid after the condenser. Okay, so it, it, is, it comes out gaseous Gash, here yeah. at a high, high pressure. pressure yeah. High temperature, yeah. Okay, and then it gets liquefied in there, mm -hmm. okay. And then um, it's coming out liquefied at ambient temperature. Nearly ambient, nearly ambient. Bit higher. Okay, okay. So normally 7K. But that, or that more. must be then high pressure. Still very high pressure. High, very yeah. high pressure because CO2 at ambient. Uh, to get that into liquid, what kind of pressures are we talking about there? Um, it's up to 100 bar. Ah, okay. All right. Okay. And then comes that through there, and then as it expands, it then um, yeah, it gets into gaseous state again. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Okay. So, w what are the metrics? You know, so what are some of the numbers? I mean, you've, you've talked about 100 bar here. Yeah. Um, we've talked about minus 40 degrees. Are there other are 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 numbers that we need to know? How much, let me say, kilowatt <laughs> do you need mm -hmm. to cool? Or, like, are there something we can learn there? For a uh, um, car application, so yeah. for a car filling station, we install normally uh, 45 kilowatts thermal, thermal energy. Okay, 45 kilowatts. Yeah, okay. capacity. Yes, yes, yes. And, for, and it's for T40. That means the temperature window between minus 33 and yes. minus 40. Yes, yeah. You have to fulfill this, this temperature window yes. during the filling at yes. public stations. Yes, yes. Uh, and for buses, um, we install normally 145 kilowatts cooling power, so that's way more. Okay. And we cool it down to T20 protocol, that's minus 17 to minus 26. Mm -hmm. and, and, okay, so these are huge <laughs> numbers, yeah? <laughs> I'm just a little bit taken aback. Um, so 45 kilowatt and 145 kilowatt for, for bus application, so that means that you, uh, you, while, when you need this amount of energy, so when, during the refueling process only or, or <coughs> other times? At this type, at the yeah. direct cooling, we yeah. need it only during the filling. So ah. if the filling starts, our unit is starting Sorry. and yeah. cools down okay. and uh, regulates uh, on the required cooling capacity. So these 45 kilowatts are not all the time. Yes, it's okay, understood. Just uh, on, on the point. Okay, yeah. okay. So, so let's say for those three or four or five, whatever minutes it is, that's the time that cooling Correct. is needed. Okay, yeah. so it's a very short burst of, okay, okay. Yeah. And, and okay, so, I mean, <laughs> coming from there, I, I, I've heard, uh, you know, people discussing, obviously, costs of the entire hydrogen supply chain and so on. I mean, with that much power demand, I think then cooling would take uh, some amount of, Cost in, in yeah. that, right? Yeah. What else makes cooling expensive? You can see, I mean, like uh, we've seen the energy consumption side, but mm -hmm. you know, what else makes cooling expensive? Um, I can tell you about an example, let's say. Yeah. Like hydrogen cars are very expensive at the moment, mm -hmm. and diesel or uh, uh, gas uh, cars are way cheaper. Yeah. So I think it's the same way with the cooling or yeah. the, the whole technology for stations. Uh, we see a lot of scale-up effects. Yes. So if this technology uh, is scaling up, also the cooling will be cheaper. Ah, so, okay, so that gets cheaper. Do we always need cooling for refueling, actually, or not? No, it's not, not always required. Ah. On public station, it's, it's required if you want to fulfill this standard. Mm -hmm. But if you have lots of time, yeah. then you can fill slow, ah. but uh, without cooling. Okay, so that means, okay, so if you... If you so what are we talking about? So three minutes, okay, obviously that's the fast one. Yeah. But if I wanted to fill, let's say it was a regular car without cooling, how long would that take? Uh, depending on the ambient, but can be 10 hours. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. So, but that's slowly seeping yeah. the gas in. Okay, understood. Wow, okay. Florian, you were just um, saying that, well, you see scaling effects. Can you maybe take us a little bit on an outlook? So cooling of hydrogen, obviously we all want to refill fast, so therefore mm -hmm. we will need it. What do you see happening in the next 10, 20 years in the area of cooling? Um, 
I think it will be it will concentrate on natural re refrigerants, yeah. so only, um, and we're doing our best to fulfill that. And uh, and as you might know, uh, at the at the fridge, yeah. there's uh, 500 grams of a refrigerant, and uh, not non non, uh, it's a synthetic one, let's okay. say. Yes, yes. Um, and that impacts a global warming potential for 700 kilo, kilogram of CO2. Okay. So that that's that cannot be the way. So I think the the future will be uh, only natural refrigerants. Okay, yeah, so natural refrigerants. Okay, yeah. Okay, wow. So there you go. That I mean, since you guys are already focusing on the natural refrigerants, would be something like CO2. Yeah. Obviously. Okay. Yeah, we focus on CO2 for yeah. this kind of application. application yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are there other natural refrigerants? Yeah. I'm getting curious here. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are flammable refrigerants. Yeah. They're natural, like propane or ethane. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but they are for other temperature values. Ah, let's say. Okay, so if you want to go to down to minus 40, then that's CO2. Then CO2 is our choice, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I guess uh, <laughs> there, there's a lot to be built out in the future, and I think uh, you guys are real. I mean, this, we, you have actually managed to make this rather complex topic of cooling, and I know thermodynamics can be a, a bit of an issue. <laughs> uh, you've made it very simple here, so thank you very much, uh, Florian, for, for doing that. Um, yeah, and with that, we've actually come to, to the end of uh, today's session. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you are interested in cooling, well, there's uh, Florian that you can reach out to, and you can find him on HiFinder, where you can find all kinds of things related to the hydrogen economy to make your systems work, components, services, all these kind of things. Um, so uh, we hope you enjoyed this session, and uh, if yes, please give us a like or drop us a comment somewhere on LinkedIn or wherever. Um, we will be happy to also have you view another video and uh, Florian, we can continue the conversation sometime about this. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.